Well, Christmas. Our presenter is art is historian Jane O'Neill. This presentation is sponsored by the Friends of the Hamden Library. My name is Elisabeth Angele. I am responsible for information and patron services at the Hamden Public Library. Before I introduce you to our presenter this evening, I would like to do some Zoom keeping and mention two upcoming library programs. Please note that we will record this program, but not the question and answer session. We will send out a follow-up email with the recording link. To achieve the best sound quality, everyone should be muted. When you want to participate in the discussion, please unmute yourself. There are different ways to do that on the microphone icon on the left-hand side of the Zoom toolbar. Simply click on that or hold down the space bar on your computer or hold down the Alt key and the letter A. Once you have finished sharing your thoughts, please mute yourself again. I would now like to mention two upcoming library programs related to the topic of this evening's presentation. Celebrate the diversity of Hamden at a holiday sing-along. This will take place December 20th at 6 p.m. at the Brundage Community Library on 91 Circular Avenue here in Hamden. Registration is recommended, but not required. Song submissions can be sent through the online registration form. Submissions will be accepted through December 15th. And if you go to the Hamden Library website, hamdenlibrary.org, you can click on programs and move to the date December 20th and register and submit your song request. The second program is a uh, grab and go craft. It's um, solstice lanterns for all ages. Usher in the winter with a solstice lantern craft. This grab and go activity is for youth, teen and adult patrons. You can stop by and pick up a grab and go kit at any of our three branches at the information desk at Miller Library in the children's department and at our two branch libraries. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter this evening, Jane O'Neill. Jane O'Neill curates and delivers art appreciation programs to audiences throughout New England. She holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of the New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. Thank you for presenting this evening, Ms. O'Neill. It's my pleasure, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to get a little bit more of that holiday cheer uh, via Norman Rockwell, and he is the best person to get you feeling um, ready for the season. So we we're starting off here with this adorable child sticking his face through the wreath, um, and that's sort of where we're going tonight. We're going to go all in. We're diving in to the holiday spirit. I should mention that um, Norman Rockwell never met a redhead he didn't want to paint. <laughs> so you'll see, you'll be seeing plenty of them tonight. Let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend our time together. Tonight's program is about an hour. 
And we're going to get started with a very brief introduction to Norman Rockwell, because I assume if you're here, you probably have heard of him before. We'll talk a little bit about the roots of Christmas in American culture. And that gives us a sense in terms of uh, what did Christmas look like before Norman Rockwell started painting it? What was he responding to, building off of, all of that? And then I've broken out his um, his uh, winter and Christmas images into these categories. And I think that these are kind of the categories through which we experience the holidays too. First, it gets cold. Then you start thinking about all of the traditions that you um that you love to sort of re-experience every year. You start preparing for the holiday, you get out those decorations, put up a tree, and then you start really getting excited about the day itself, especially if you're a little kid. And I think some of Norman Rockwell's pictures can really take you back to that feeling. We'll talk about his images of people coming together to celebrate and then actually celebrating. And then he's very good at showing us scenes of exhaustion too. So um, so lots to cover here. Let's dive right in with our sort of reintroduction to Norman Rockwell. And I should mention that the image here before we leave this slide, this image here is sort of like Rockwell shooting the moon because he typically, um, he typically sort of finds like one holiday tradition, one element of the holiday and then zeroes in on that. But here you've got a lot of them. You've got uh, Santa at the door. You've got children playing. You've got the Christmas tree. It's all, and you've got the church. So you see, you see a lot of of what he's interested all coming together in this one image from 1972. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Norman Rockwell and really how he got uh, how he got interested in creating these images. So just to get us oriented in space and time, he was born just before the turn of the century. And he's still known as America's most beloved illustrator. And when I use that term illustrator, it's really kind of splitting hairs because he was a fine art artist. He was trained to paint with oil paints in the same way that an artist who was exhibiting in a gallery or museum might be doing. But he was creating images sort of on demand, on commission for, um, for his clients. And I think for the most part, we know of his um, of his best client, one of his longest running clients, and that was the Saturday Evening Post. He worked for them for 47 years and produced more than 320 covers for them in that time. So it's safe to say that he was prolific. And during that time, he really, um, he really helped to reflect and define American culture. He, um, his images were heartwarming. They were, um, they were sweet, almost saccharine to some people, but they very much related to the, the middle-class American ex existence. They also related oftentimes to patriotic themes, which is why we think like uh, uh, Norman Rockwell's images uh, are so representative of American culture in general. I mean, he was painting Boy Scouts, he was painting portraits of presidents on both sides of the aisle. So, so um, there's a lot there that associates him with America at large. And uh, the image here is one of his most famous. This is his uh, triple self-portrait. And it, uh, it was on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in 1960, really just before he left the, the magazine. And here they are referring to him as America's most loved artist. So there was a little bit of a relationship rift there, there that they were trying to heal, but you can really see he was so important to America by that point. And so many of the images that we'll see tonight are him sort of working his way up to that stature. So let's turn our attention now to, um, well, before we shift gears, I, I think it's important when we think about Rockwell helping to define American culture, uh, thinking about how he reflected American holidays in his work. Of course, the image here on the left is one of his most famous images, but it's from the Four Freedoms series from 1943. And it's called the freedom from want. But I think to most people, it is an image of Thanksgiving. And this is how we imagine American Thanksgivings. This is what we want it to look like. We all want the biggest turkey possible. We all want the entire family crammed around the table. And in the same way, I think he helped to define the way we think of Santa. This is one of his very jolly renditions of Santa. I believe this was for a Kellogg's advertisement in the 1950s. But this is a very 
very approachable, very uh, uh, jolly Santa who that he's depicted here. And he helps to, uh, again, define the way we think of the holiday and we think of um, our children or children themselves engaging with, with this figure. So let's think a little bit about what Christmas looked like in American culture, sort of before Norman Rockwell got involved with creating these kinds of images. And I think what's really important to keep in mind is that for um, for a long period of time in America, really from its its beginning, right up until 1870, when um, when Christmas became an official holiday in the United States. Um, for that long stretch there, there was really not necessarily a unified way of celebrating Christmas in this country. For some people, it was just a drinking holiday. For some people, it was religious, but it might not have been the same kind of traditions that we think about today. But of course, there were these two texts that had um, sort of an outsized influence in terms of the way people thought of Christmas. And one of them was Clement Moore's uh, The Night Before Christmas, where we think of, of Santa as this jolly little elf. And then, of course, Dickens's uh, Christmas Carol, where we have this this um, this idea of of, of charity, of, of of giving to the poor. God bless us, everyone, with Bob Cratchit. So, um, so these are two texts that help to shape the way Americans thought of this holiday, and certainly helped to influence Norman Rockwell because at, when he grew up, his father would sit and read him um, Dickens. He would he would listen to the Christmas Carol, and he would formulate those characters and what they look like in his mind. And so we'll see that coming back through his artwork too. There was another important cartoonist named Thomas Nast who was working at the end of the 19th century. And he did a lot of cartoons about Santa as well um, with a lot of influence from Clement Moore here too. This idea of, of Santa being an elf <laughs> really uh, factors in large. So he's jolly, he's got this very big belly here. Actually, I, I take that back. He's not fully jolly yet. I think Thomas Nast had a, a, had a tendency to give us a Santa that was a little bit disturbing. Like if you were these kids sitting in this bed and you saw this guy lurking in your, in your fireplace here, you might not be um, that excited. <laughs> this Santa isn't um, isn't quite our 20th century version of Santa yet, but he's he's got the right costume and um, and he's got the right intention. He's there to drop off the toys, right? So that brings us to the 20th century uh, version of Santa that I think most of us know so well, and that is the Coca-Cola Santa. And many people uh, are under the false impression that Norman Rockwell invented this Santa, that he was the one that made these illustrations that have helped to define the way we think of Santa today. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. The artist here is Haddon Sudbloom, and he started creating these Coca-Cola Santas in 1931. Um, there's, a, there's even an idea out there that the only reason Santa wears red is because it's Coca-Cola, but as we saw, Thomas Nash, uh, uh, Nast was already doing that in the 19th century. But here we get, a, once again, a, an extremely joyful pink cheeked Santa, uh, uh, a grandfatherly figure that you would surely love to send your kids running off to, to sit on his lap and, and ask for their Christmas wishes. Now I want to sort of define for you how Norman Rockwell did things a little bit different from his contemporaries at the Saturday Evening Post. What we're looking at right now is an illustration from 1952 that was not done by Norman Rockwell. And what we see in this Christmas cover, it's a December cover, um, what we can see are all of these Christmas shoppers and they're waiting at the bus stop and they're all kind of, you know, weighed down by their packages. They're frustrated that they have to wait. They all have stuff in their hands. There's even this guy sort of leaning forward, looking to get on maybe an approaching bus. But um, but really this artist whose name was Steve Dahanos, um, he's kind of focusing on the frustrations of the holiday. And that's not what Norman Rockwell wanted to deliver. Rockwell wanted to give us the magic. Now, I'm a little bit remiss in showing you this picture because I always idealized it. This is uh, such a sweet picture of these like angelic looking children who have already opened their presents and they're sitting on this ottoman and they're leaning, uh, they're leaning forward with their hands clasped in their laps, 
And I thought, surely they're like listening to some story from, um, from a grandparent or something like that. Even the dog seems attentive, right? Well, just a few months ago, I saw the image in, in full and it's actually an ad for TV. So they're just watching TV, but still there's a sense of magic and connection here. Rockwell gives us these sweet scenes um, that uh, sometimes have a, a little bit of, of a religious reference, but for the most part, it's really just an overlay for him. He didn't have strong religious sentiment himself. So he would um, he would use his religious references uh, very lightly. Over here on the left, we have an image that from the 1950s called the nativity. Well, it's a nativity play, but it's called the dress rehearsal. And I think by not calling it the nativity play, by calling it the dress rehearsal, we sort of get the sense that these two little kids that are uh, sort of assessing each other in this moment, um, that they are, that they're doing a dress rehearsal for adulthood, that there's almost like a flirtation that's happening here, that they're figuring out how to interact with each other. Over on the right, we have the choir boy, also from the 1950s. And there's, um, a, again, that religious overtone, he's probably singing in a church setting, but there's a silliness to this one that I, I, I mean, it always cracks me up when I see it. This little boy with his mouth wide open, mouth agape, and um, being accompanied by all of these angels sort of twisting about him. And some of them even have their mouths wide open as, as the singer does. But we just know from that wide open mouth, from the sort of gangly proportions here too, that this little guy is not hitting the right note. <laughs> when it comes to Rockwell and religious sentiment around the holidays, um, what he really stood for in life was simply the golden rule. And he had um, he had produced this image in the early 1960s because he felt so strongly about it. So um, we'll come back to this image a little bit later, but to him, this was this was the the biggest most important idea that came out of religion, and I, it was his guiding principle in life. So um, so for the most part, the uh, the religious feelings ar around the holiday are really just sort of skimming the surface for Rockwell. So let's turn our attention to winter. The days are getting so much shorter, right? It feels like midnight at four o'clock and Rockwell wanted to handle that. He wanted to address that um, and, and make it funny as often as he could. So as the days get shorter, he produced these uh, funny set of images for a, a calendar where we see these two older gentlemen who get together, they go and visit each other. And, um, and they're like an odd couple in some ways, at least in terms of their physical proportion, one sort of stout and one sort of gay with like a, a this long neck and sort of a beaky nose and they go to each other and they kind of cheer each other up with this with this silliness so we can <laughs> see he's the visitor and in this case he's got his coat over um over his chair and then his friend has come to visit him in the winter and so this is rockwell's way of reminding us of how silly and fun a game of checkers might be a conversation about Baseball could be so impassioned and, and you know lead to these heated feelings, but you get the sweetness here with like the dog underneath the chair in both of the pictures, and it might remind us of a visit from our favorite neighbor or favorite friend that you only see occasionally as as the days get shorter. Now Rockwell, keeping with the humor, he gives us this great image here, and he's playing off of uh, of an old say. This is an image from 1962 called "Expert Salesman," and of course, what is he selling? He's selling ice, or in this case, a refrigerator. And who is he selling it to? The Eskimos. And of course, he looks incredibly confident in his talents. You know, once again, his mouth is agape, mm -hmm. and um, and he's got this kind of grand gesture here. Notice how. Out, there's like this uh -huh. um, wonderful billow of, of, uh, of smoke coming <clears throat> from the end of that long cigarette and he's got everybody's attention in this moment. Now, the other great thing about it getting colder, for some people at least, is that you can go outside, you can enjoy the snow. So he loves to show young people having fun in the winter weather. Um, we've got two sledding scenes here. We've got Young Love Sledding from 1949 on the left, and then on the right, Adirondack Winter from 1974. In both cases, we've got the dogs, double dogs <laughs> over on, on the right, because dogs always signify 
love in a painting. It's good to keep that in mind. He includes them as often as possible. So with Young Love, A Boy and a Girl on the Sled, we've just got the suggestion of like almost like the curvature of the earth here in what is otherwise a, a, a almost like a blank white picture. And we've got the thrill on the faces of these two little kids as they're flying down this <laughs> hill. You can see the little <laughs> indications of the speed here. And then over on the left, uh, again, that same thrill, that same kind of fear with the scarves flying in the background, but everything looks a little bit more updated, right? So um, in addition to sledding, we've got our skating that's happening too. And I always get the sense that it's the same girl, the same model in both of these pictures. On the left, we've got a cover from the Saturday Evening Post from 1920 and a young girl who's fallen on the ice and a boy who might be her age, might be a little bit younger, is struggling to pick her up and she's sort of good humored about it. And then over on the right um, from the same year, but from the Red Cross magazine, we almost get the sense that it's that same girl and she has found uh, maybe a slightly older man who is a better companion on the ice and she <laughs> sure looks a lot more happy and confident. But um, but the ice can provide a, a setup for, for a funny moment as well for Norman Rockwell. And one of my favorite ice skating pictures from him is ice skating grandpa here. This uh, dates to 1948. And we see a grandpa who's just so delighted with his skating capabilities. He's done this kind of perfect figure eight on on the ice here the dog is kind of barking him on in um in uh in encouragement and and there's just this wonderful sense of satisfaction the way he's kicking up that back leg there and his grandson uh watching it all kind of unfold so <laughs> Remember that there's still fun to be had, even if it's dark and dreary out. So let's turn our attention to Christmas traditions, thinking about Christmas's past. And this is really, I think, what a lot of people go through is they begin to think about, you know, hauling out the decorations and that sort of thing. For Rockwell, tradition was really important. Like I said, he grew up listening to Dickens and he actually imagined himself for a long stretch of his early career as somebody who would really be making pictures exclusively about American history. Believe it or not, the only reason why he abandoned that is because um, he had a studio that caught fire and all of these old, old costumes <laughs> went up in smoke. So, um, this was, this was a major interest of his early on in his career. So we're looking at um, an image here that he did for Reader, Reader's Digest in 1937. And it's as though the book itself, um, a uh, uh, Dickens book, A uh, Christmas Carol, has actually opened up. It's life size here, and the characters are spilling out towards us. And some of them are clear and recognizable. Some of them are sort of like imagined motifs that go along with it. But we feel this kind of instant connection to them. They they're made so um, so human, so fully three dimensional by Norman Rockwell's painting. So. Then he goes on to kind of break out these characters in separate paintings. This is another cover for the Saturday Evening Post where we have Bob, Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim and we can see just how poor they are. We see the patches on Cratchit's knees, his, his shoes that are just falling apart here. But we have um, we have this family unit that is still counting their blessings, uh, even though they're poor in terms of their purse, they're so strong in, in their character. And this pose here is probably something that Norman Rockwell picked up right from the text itself. This is an illustration of, um, of A Christmas Carol from a, a 19th century version of, of the text here. So, you know, raising the little crutch in the air up on his father's shoulder, it's it comes right out of the text. Here are other characters that, that Rockwell goes back to. It's this kind of uh, early American kissing couple, maybe it's like a uh, late Victorian, a sort of a British couple. But here we see them uh, essentially again, a man who's sort of sneaking up behind a woman who's got a serving platter with a, a pewter pitcher on it and she's sort of leaning backwards to accept that kiss notice he's got the mistletoe here and um and norman rockwell is maybe even making kind of a naughty joke here in terms of the way that the man is holding his his hat 
there. Um, notice that he's just come in from the, the cold and there's like a little bit of snow still on the edges of his cape and his boots here. Now, they're not specific characters necessarily in from the text, but they, they kind of speak to that time. So does the way he's writing Merry Christmas. That's um, fully intentional that he's misspelling it there. He also painted this dancing couple, which um, they're just so uh, <laughs> plump and delightful. <laughs> they're kind of dancing underneath this candelabra with uh, the mistletoe here, and they're just having the time of their lives. Again, it's Merry Christmas. It's from another time. But uh, in several editions of A Christmas Carol, you see a similar dancing couple. This would have been um, uh, Scrooge's uh, original boss, Fezziwig. So, um, so we get the sense that even though they're, they're kind of portly here, they're very happy and light on their feet in this moment. And we get the sense of, of merriment and, and joyful um, expression in, in an image like this. So with a few more images that can speak to the notion of Christmas's past, we have these singers here. And we've already seen that choir singer with his mouth sort of agape. And this Christmas trio here, which is a 1923 illustration from Norman Rockwell, is sort of vaguely set in London with our architectural background. And we've got we got uh, two singers and one horn player here, and our violin player has sort of opened his mouth to sing along with the little boy, and both of them kind of have these these slightly askew jaws here. I'm not sure if they're singing it, if they're singing in a way that we'd actually want to hear, but we get the sense of a quaintness of 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 a Christmas tradition, and of course the text below, Christmas sing merrily. So it reminds us, even without hearing it. It reminds us of the Christmas carols that, that we all know and love and go back to every year. So one last traditional image for you, and this one, it's like you can't help but smile when you see this man's face, right? It's He's the plumpest, most pear-shaped man you could imagine. He's got those big red cheeks here, and he is called the Coachman with the Whip. This is from 1929. So this is just after the stock market crash, Norman Rockwell is trying to um, create a Christmas image that will kind of buoy Americans, that will shore them up and make them feel excited about the holidays, even though America is in one of the worst crises it could ever experience. So he's wearing um, this, this incredible overcoat with filled with all these golden buttons. It looks like one of them is kind of missing here. And I love how this whip is kind of um, kind of spinning around his body in this moment. But he seems like an absolutely joyful character that can kind of lift spirits as he, as he um, smiles out at us. So um, let's turn our attention now to preparation. And many of you are probably in this moment in your own lives, thinking about like, dragging decorations out of the basement, out of the attic. How do you prepare your, your homes um, for this big holiday season? And so Norman Rockwell was focused on this in his illustrations from early on. This is a cover for a magazine called Country Gentlemen. And this dates to 1920. And we see these two little boys who look so focused, right? And really satisfied with the work that they've just done. And what have they done? They've gone out into the woods, presumably, and cut down their own Christmas tree. And they're striding back towards home as the sun is setting. Notice he's carrying the tree and the ax, and the ax is sort of emphasized by these clouds in the sky. They've got the dog. The dog emphasizes this, this sense of love here, but there's a warmth to this and, um, and a real sort of sense of, uh, of intention to these young boys. They're uh, taking part in something that they really feel strongly about. Notice how, um, how postures change with the same subject in the 1950s. <laughs> so now we've still got two boys. One of them's a little bit older. They've gotten their tree and now it's all about confidence and swagger, right? Now they're leaning backwards <laughs> and the tree is, is this tiny little spindly tree. There must have been a trend in the 1950s for tiny spindly little trees. Now they're accompanied by even more dogs and they've got this kind of wonderful wallpaper of elves and candles and, and bulbs and that sort of thing in the background here. But the boys are still taking care of it. Um, 
another image about putting up the tree that I just absolutely love, another spindly 1950s uh, Christmas tree. And we've got this, you know, fairly rotund dad on top of this ladder. And he's being anchored backwards by a very concerned wife as he's trying to, to put the star on top of this tree. And just to add to the chaos, we've got two dogs and a cat. So it's full chaos running around them at the bottom of the picture as they're trying to, you know, use every bulb and every strand of popcorn here to just kind of give a little bit of life to this tree. But this wonderful sense of balance <laughs> as, as we see it going up. Um, trees definitely got a lot fuller by the 1970s. This is an image that Norman Rockwell made for the Franklin Mint. And um, it's 1973, and now we see that this is a picture that's all about family connections. Those wonderful moments, like when you're together decorating and um, and really celebrating the season um, and enjoying each other's company. So in this moment, the father's reaching around the tree towards his young son, who's handing him a bulb. And in this moment, that connection sort of feels like the garland to the tree itself. And we've got this short squat, uh, sort of squat pro proportioned tree that we're looking at here. So moving right along, I'm going to show you an image that I'm sure most of you have seen before. This is, of course, a depiction of downtown, downtown Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which is where um, Norman Rockwell spent the final decades of his life. It's this quaint, tiny, picturesque town that he painted this long panoramic of. Um, in 1967, he painted this for McCall's magazine. The actual painting itself is about eight feet long. So all of the little details here of these shop fronts are a little bit easier to see when you're looking at it um, in real life. But I think what most people often miss is that this is a Christmas scene. And if you're leaning in and can really um, uh, you know, get your glasses up there, you might notice that there are a ton of little Christmas trees and wreaths here. And right here in the foreground, we've got a family that's been out shopping and they're kind of returning to their car. So all of this activity that we see out in Stockbridge at this time of the year, at this time of the day, are people shopping for Christmas. And Norman Rockwell captured this kind of quaint ideal moment in his own hometown um, right at this wonderful time of the year. So thinking about shopping, which is such a huge part of preparation for everybody. Uh, back when you couldn't just order your gifts online, people, of course, went to stores. So we have a 1916 cover here with uh, a grandpa who's out shopping for the grandkids in a toy store. And he's already made some purchases. They're tucked into his pocket here. And you can see that the shop girl is um, sort of entertaining grandpa by uh, as he's trying on a Santa hat and a Santa beard, and she's holding up a mirror and, and a little figurine of Santa so he can see how closely he approximates Santa there. So he's getting a little kick out of that. We can see that he's taken off his, his top hat in order to do that. And this will be a theme that Rockwell goes back to a lot, this idea of Santa as grandpa. Now, Fast forward to the 1950s and um, and shopping for Christmas looks a lot different. This is one of my favorite Norman Rockwell pictures. This is called Shop Girl Christmas Eve. And um, sorry, this is from 1947, actually. Norman Rockwell wanted to show this kind of rag doll <laughs> uh, shop girl at the end of the day on Christmas Eve. And, um, and he actually went to Marshall Fields in Chicago in order to find like the perfect shop girl to, to use as a model. And he, while he was there, he just didn't find anybody that really met what he imagined in his mind. So he went to a diner to kind of go and recollect his thoughts. And while he's there, he saw a waitress and he's like, yes, you are my shop girl. So if there's something about this woman with like her, the pencil sticking out of her hair and, and this book in front of her that reminds you of a waitress, it's because that's who she was. So so um, here she is at the end of the day, she's wearing this little um, pin on her on her chest that is a watch that tells us that it's just after five on Christmas Eve. We see that her shop has been absolutely destroyed. There are dolls and paper everywhere. She's kicked off her shoes and look at those feet. Don't you just like get like a sympathy ache and a stretch in your toes as you look at her. We can all imagine how ragged she feels, um, just as ragged as those dolls that are lying around everywhere. Here is one of the photographs Norman Rockwell took of his model as, as the source for this particular image. 
Now, nobody has more work to do in terms of preparation for Christmas than Santa Claus. So he does a lot of images of Santa preparing for Christmas. And they're so relatable because every parent is sort of in on this, on the other side of this work, or, or um, we're doing something very similar. This Santa is, um, is of course, reading wish lists that are being sent to him via US mail that we can see in the big bag over here. So he's sitting at like a little accountant's table. He's got this one candle for light. He's got a halo. He's got the, um, the quill that he's connected to his temple here, and he's going through the stacks of mail. Um, we can imagine that he's getting it by the truckload. Look at our Santa. He's, um, he's of course, got the big white beard and, um, and, and the full red ensemble here. And Santa doesn't change too much from image to image, but we do see a Santa that uh, kind of slowly evolves into an accountant, a full accountant with the little green visor, uh, because Santa has to kind of weigh, like, who's going to get what we can see him over here on the left with his book of you know the kid the naughty and the nice list basically and he's measuring that against his his budget his expenses and as he's doing that with his little visor on he is also imagining all the sweet faces of all the good little boys and girls throughout the world that uh, are sort of in this kind of ether behind him there and then we have another smiling santa who is doing a sort of similar work with a very large book in front of him, but he's looking up and, and sort of enjoying himself as he does this. So more preparation on Santa's part. I love this image from 1924. We have a little boy who is working very hard, very earnestly out in front of his family's house. And he's just gone out to cut the wood, to chop the, uh, the firewood himself. And he is industriously bringing it back inside, accompanied by his little dog. And then Santa, who's sort of like larger than life here, he looms behind the scene like this magnificent mountain, like an ethereal mountain. And he is making a note of how good this kid is. And don't we all remember those moments as, as as a kid where you're like, oh, Santa, I hope you're watching this because this is getting me on the nice list. Um, more images of Santa sort of preparing uh, for the holiday. In 1926 here, we can see him examining the globe with a little um, magnifying glass echoed with the halo overhead. Now he's got bells around his leg. He's got a tiny little book of just good boys and presumably some good girls in there too. Over on the right, we see him back with that uh, accountant's visor. And now he's he's keeping a sharp eye. He's looking through a telescope at what's going on and he's getting a real kick out of it too. Probably seeing a lot of the negotiations that happen this time of year. Um, this version of, of Santa is from 1939, and Santa is absolutely enormous here. He's got this big apple-shaped body. He's all red. He's up on top of this little ladder in front of a massive uh, map of the world, and he's mapping out his route using this red ribbon um, and referring to this tiny little book of extra good boys and girls. So, so he's got to figure out where he's going. This is what happens, you know, before GPS. <laughs> so um, sometimes the preparation is just overwhelming. We've, we saw an exhausted shop girl, and now we see a Santa that can hardly keep up with the pace, uh, the demand in terms of, of building toys. So these are two versions of essentially the same concept, uh, separated, separated by a couple of decades um, Santa with elves. And so Santa has sort of nodded off here and the elves are jumping in to make sure that these toys get um, get get made, get painted and get uh, stuffed in the sack over here. So I think even more elves over here on the right, uh, uh, sort of a 1950s updated version of it. Um, so just a few more images of preparation. I always found this one really interesting where we see Santa sort of up applying the makeup. He's almost in, in um, like a uh, an actor in the theater, so, sort of preparing for the role here. And we see the wig in the background and really this kind of wonderful sense of earnestness as he's preparing for um, his big moment. Our last image of preparation is our Santa, who is maybe a grandpa, maybe a Santa. He's in a workshop that could also very well be a garage or an attic. It's kind of dark, but we see a number of toys and we see this wonderful sweet man with a um, long white beard who looks just delighted by 
his creations here. So we turn our attention now to anticipation and there's nothing like anticipating, anticipating Christmas when you're a kid. He, uh, Rockwell gives us this wonderful scene. This is from um, the cover of Literary Digest, it's from 1920. I think that there's a scene in the Christmas story movie that's very similar to this, this idea of little kids walking past the, um, the department store window and just being so drawn in by their vision of toys. Rockwell isn't as concerned with the toys. He just gives us like a silhouette that we can guess, you know, a Jack in the box, a teddy bear, a doll, that sort of thing. But it's the faces. It's the smiling faces. It's that wonderful sense of anticipation of could these things be under our tree in a matter of days or weeks. Uh, we also see this wonderful sense of anticipation with the Jolly Postman. This is from um, 1949. And here we sort of see the postman having some fun imagining that he's Santa in this moment. He's got all the packages to deliver, um, including all of the, the holiday cards and that sort of thing. And we can see that the kids are so thrilled thinking some of those wrapped packages could be theirs. Um, sometimes it, these anticipation scenes are really about Santa being so delighted by, by these moments to engage with the kids. And I think if you have kids or grandkids, these are oftentimes just wonderful kind of precious memories when the kids so earnestly ask for, you know, what their heart's desire is. So in this 1927 uh, cover, uh, Santa is just enormous. He's larger than life. And he's holding this child on the tips of his fingers. He's this tiny little child who with, who with his hands behind his back is just, we can imagine, just earnestly requesting uh, some special item. And Santa seems just delighted by him. And Santa over on the, on the, on the right shares that sort of sense of wonder and delight in these innocent little kids in their white pajamas. And we can see their fantasies kind of swirling uh, around all of these figures in a, in a circle, um, sort of uh, capturing, encapsulating all of these figures together in this wonderful moment of, of anticipation. Now, then we go to bed at night, ideally, <laughs> and Norman Rockwell gives us another sweet little child who is wearing the white pajamas, is as innocent as an angel here. They've hung their stocking, a very humble stocking on the on the end of their bed, and they're about to head to bed before Christmas. And so we can imagine there's so much hope and anticipation for a little one getting into bed that night. And we know not every child stays in bed on that night. And we've got this great image here of a kid who sort of snuck down the stairs and sees essentially not mommy kissing Santa Claus, but Santa Claus kissing mommy. And so it's this wonderful moment where, um, where they sort of uh, uh, snuck up on something that maybe they weren't supposed to see. Mom's even kind of surprised, even though she's kind of leaning into this moment. We've got the source photography that uh, Norman Rockwell did himself, uh, where we can see him kind of framing up the image that he imagined. But it, it's certainly, you know, dad in costume, mom uh, in, in, um, in her house clothes, but they're getting ready for the holiday. And maybe this little guy is seeing something he's not supposed to. Uh, Norman Rockwell featured little kids getting out of bed too early several times throughout his career. These are some of my, of my favorite. On the left, we have an image called, Is He Coming from 1920? And we see these two little children. We almost feel like we are, we are, we are with them, we are among them, we are another one of these little kids because she turns back to us as like a collaborator here. And we've got this wonderful scene that's lit by the firelight, by the candle, and we've got the kids peering up into the chimney and we're all wondering in this moment, is, is he going to arrive? Um, over on the right, we've got sort of an updated notion of that. We're not pulled into the scene in quite the same way, but we do get this wonderful sense of magic with like these little white um, uh, like puffs that seem to be arising up from the from the fireplace here. Is there something kind of magical about to transpire in this moment? Uh, another vision of a child that couldn't stay in bed all night. <laughs> We've got this one here. How can you not love this kid? He seems like a great forerunner to uh, the movie Home Alone. This is a 1950s version of a little boy um, 
who's hysterically kind of uh, holding this candlestick and his alarm clock. It's uh, 5 a.m. <laughs> he's stumbled downstairs and he's just in awe at what he sees under the tree. It's not really supposed to be there, but, uh, but we've got a, a little bit of a chuckle because he is. Some of the... Oh, I'm sure some of you have a kid like this in your family. Maybe you were this kid, the kid that thinks I'm going to stay up all night. I'm not going to bed. I want to see the big guy. And so Norman Rockwell captured these kids so wonderfully over the years. It was a theme that he went back to. So on Literary Digest, the little girl wrapped in a quilt in the wingback chair has fallen asleep with her dog and Santa comes in and he is sort of tickled by her attempt to stay up. And then again, in the 1950s, these sweet little innocents in their white pajamas, again, in a wingback chair. And, um, and Santa seems just absolutely delighted to see them there. Now, the image that got Norman Rockwell into the most trouble, I would say the most trouble in his career was actually a Christmas image. And it's this next one here. This one is called The Discovery. This is from 1956. This got a lot of mail to the Saturday Evening Post because Norman Rockwell was kind of revealing a little bit too much with a picture like this. Um, he found a little boy to be his model. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. He bought the little boy these pajamas and gave the mother instructions. Uh, send him home, have him sleep in these pajamas for a week. Don't wash them. Come back to my studio. We'll take some photographs. Here's the little model. <laughs> um, but let's talk about this picture that he created in the discovery. It's, um, it's, I, I think it's so smart in so many ways. So we see this little boy who is standing in front of dad's chest in dad's room. He's upstairs in this house, right? It's the middle of the day. And we know it's dad's chest because of the pipe and, and the brushes up here. He's in the bottom drawer. He's been snooping around like he's not supposed to be. And he's found this uh, package. He's untied it. So it's almost like a... It's like a parallel to Christmas in some ways. And he's found the Santa suit in here. And uh, do you see all these white balls? You know what these are, right? These are mothballs. You can smell them the second you say the word mothball. And um, and they sort of almost function like snow in this little landscape here with like the green carpet. So it, it's like a bizarro Christmas. Um, I love the fact that he's holding the fake beard here that's attached to the hat because we always think of kids sitting on a Santa's lap and pulling the beard. And here he's like pulled the beard while he's holding the beard, holding on to that beard um, with this big new realization in life, right? So he's he's realizing something about Santa and something about his parents at the same time. We can see a similar realization in, in this picture from uh, 1940. It's called Reindeer's Day Off, Santa on a Train. And so this department store Santa, who's kind of kind of trying to disguise himself. He shoved his beard and his hat into his pocket, is sitting on the train, and a little boy who's been shopping at that same department store is doing a big double take at this guy now that he sees him out of context. Uh, more discoveries. <laughs> Norman Rockwell really liked to stay with the discovery. Uh, we have a little girl that we see in a mirror, her reflection has walked into this room. I always get the sense that this is like a, a family holiday party or something like that, because mom is in the midst of sewing dad into the suit with the big belly. And they both um, look very guilty in this moment of discovery here. So let's turn our attention to reunions because let's face it, this is really the best part of any holiday celebration, getting back together with all of your loved ones, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins that you don't see as often as you'd like. And so Rockwell had a special magic for uh, depicting images about reunion. So we start with this image of really, it's about coming home. And this is called Homecoming from 1949. And we can see that this young woman has just gotten off of the train at this tiny little station. And it's a horse-drawn carriage that is bringing her home for Christmas. She's got the presents on her lap. And we've got this kind of portly um, 
uh, older man who's who's driving the coach. You don't necessarily sense that it's it's her father, but there is uh, the wonderful details, not just of the horse here, but the dog with his ears flying back in the wind. And and of course, this this man who's who's steering the coach sort of reminds me of that jolly coachman that we saw from uh, back in the 1920s. Uh, more images about reunions. Um, it's always wonderful when grandma and grandpa come home. And, and so here we see a grandpa who has this kind of halo of the wreath in the background. Uh, night has fallen, there are stars in the sky. He is sitting by what is presumably um, the, the fire in the, in the fireplace uh, with his grandchildren on either side no doubt spinning a yarn, but really appreciating and admiring these sweet little people beside him. This grandpa here comes uh, prepared with presents <laughs> and he is inviting this sweet little toddler here to explore his pockets. And of course the toddler just hasn't found yet uh, the best present ever that is on the other side of, of grandpa's jacket. Um, more grandpas, more uh, uh, more family reunions. We have a grandpa that is coming uh, to to visit. This little guy has made a not so flattering rendition of grandpa out of the snow with uh, with the pipe and the googly eyes here, and he's kind of hiding behind the Santa. But uh, but grandpa, or, or I should say, the snowman, and but grandpa's getting a kick out of it and laughing at it. Uh, this kind of well-to-do grandpa, you get the sense that he's dressed very well. Um, presumably had his arms just overloaded with all of these presents, has fallen backwards into the snow. So we just see all of these elements, the, the packages, the dolls, uh, grandpa himself kind of sticking out of this field of white here, uh, the big surprise. And, and interestingly, Rockwell had used this motif earlier for a Santa. You almost get the sense that this is the same model here. This is a really early um, Boy Scouts uh, cover that he did from 1913. Santa falling in the snow and being picked up by none other than the Boy Scouts. But some of my favorite family reunions that he painted um, are from the 1950s. And this is just a gorgeous image here from 1951. It's called Family at the Window. And so we sort of get the sense that they are looking down at the driveway with, um, with more family that are there to celebrate the holidays. We've got the wonderful details of the wreath, these um, these snow covered little slender branches here, these beautiful faces in, in the window, complete with the adorable dog. And we know that the front door is right down here that's adorned with, ho um, with holly. I'm going to break a little bit of the Christmas magic for you because this was an ad for Plymouth cars. <laughs> so maybe dad just drove home with his new present. Maybe it's a present for mom, but, um, but they're really admiring the car. <laughs> um, Rockwell did several uh, uh, advertisements for Plymouth cars. This is another one that's called Merry Christmas Grandma! Exclamation point for 1951. And you get the sense that that is what is coming out of this little guy's mouth here. Everybody has just um, come in from the snow and the dark and the cold into grandma's house, which is just beautifully decorated for the holidays. They're all wrapped up. They're all got handfuls of presents here. And this little guy is ready to make his presence known. Um, and of course there's the dog to add to that sense of love. But um, you get the sense that if, if he's calling up to grandma, maybe this is the perspective of grandpa um, watching all of these sweet little faces, this nice little family un unit that has come home to celebrate the holidays. Um, incidentally, this little guy right here is a real favorite because he was turned into um, uh, a Christmas ornament, which apparently has since been retired, but everybody loves that notion of Merry Christmas, Grandma. Um, I have to say my favorite out of uh, Norman Rockwell's reunions is this one here, who doesn't love a, a hug from their mom when they come home. And, um, and so this is an advertisement that Norman Rockwell did for, um, for a, a pen company. We'll see a few of these pen advertisements. But in this case, you know, she's brought home her boyfriend or her or her husband, but it's really about reconnecting with mom in this wonderful embrace here. And the guy is kind of struggling to, to connect in this moment. You can see uh, Rockwell's photograph that he took of his models and how accurately he portrayed that in the final painting too. There's just really something 
I think for me at least, that's so relatable about that embrace. And who doesn't want to be embraced like that by family members when they come home? I think this next image is like the ultimate holiday embrace. This was Norman Rockwell's last Christmas cover for the Saturday Evening Post. It's from 1948. And we can see there's almost hardly any Christmas in it. It's really about that joyful connection between family members as somebody comes into the room. There's a little bit of Christmas tree back here. There's some wrapped presents, but this is really actually the Rockwell family and friends that have gathered around. This is Norman Rockwell right here. Um, this is Grandma Moses, <laughs> the, the artist who lived nearby. This is Rockwell's wife. And this was um, actually several of his sons are, are featured in, in this uh, particular painting. But we see his uh, young adult son here who is kind of grown up. He's wearing like the, the, uh, the tan trench coat and he's come home and he's you know prepared to kind of celebrate and engage like an adult. But there's one detail here that I just love. He did bring home a bag of dirty laundry, <laughs> which is very relatable, right? But there's just... Um, there's nothing more wonderful than this feeling of, of being greeted uh, by all of these smiles, all of these people that are happy to see you. Here's just a picture of Norman Rockwell with Grandma Moses, just to give you a sense in terms of how accurate that portrayal is right there. Um, that's them celebrating her 90th birthday. So um, uh, just a few more reunions here. And this one I think is really surprising because it doesn't seem like Rockwell's style in so many ways. This was right at the end of World War II. It's called Christmas Homecoming and it's 1945. And it's really all about these smooches that are happening here. This is a different kind of homecoming, right? Because now it's the soldiers that are coming home. But Rockwell managed to squeeze in as much Christmas as he could. We've got a Santa that we see raising money from behind. We've got people hauling trees and wreaths and happily um, moving through. This is Union Station, Chicago, with um, with their presence uh, set off to uh, connect with their loved ones. Incidentally, Rockwell started to conceive this cover like in July uh, of 1945, and he got in touch with the people that run Union Station, and he said, "What kind of decorations do you do? I want to get it right." And they, and Roman Rockwell was such an institution by that time, they actually said, Mr. Rockwell, whatever you paint, we'll put it up. <laughs> so um, so he got to have some some fun imagining just how, how to decorate Union Station. So um, Rockwell even created one last image here that I wanted to share with you, which is uh, a different kind of reunion. Um, oh, those are just a few details here. This is a different kind of reunion. Um, it's it's when you can't get together with the ones that you love. This was from 1917 in the midst of World War I. Uh, we have a soldier that couldn't make it home. It's Christmas time. We can see from the package on his lap. And he is opening up this, this, this care package, but it's really his Christmas presents. And so he's got a scarf and, and warm socks and he couldn't be happier. And he's smiling out at us. Um, and Norman Rockwell mentioned or named this work as they remembered me. So that's a, a good reminder to all of us to, to keep in our hearts the people that, that can't make it home for Christmas. So um, our last two sections are pretty short. This one's called Celebration. Believe it or not, Norman Rockwell didn't focus too much on this on this subject. It's all about the, the building up, the, the anticipation. Um, he did a painting of, of, of Santa celebrating. Sort of, uh, this is actually his ad of, of, of a Coca-Cola Santa. I apologize for like the graininess of this image, but here's a detail of it. Santa's got this tiny little Coke glass and you know he's kicking back and enjoying a Coke. Uh, looks like he hasn't delivered the presents yet, but he's taking a well-deserved break. Um, here's a Pepsi ad that Norman Rockwell did. This is 1966. And the response to this ad was, Santa looks like he's got some rum in that Pepsi there. Santa's looking like he's having a great time. Um, here's a different kind of celebration. And I think that this is such a powerful image. This was an image that he did. I believe this was for McCall's. Um, it's from 1964 and it's called Little Girl Looking Downstairs at a Christmas Party. We see all the details of like the holly and the garland that way. 
And the little girl who's gotten out of bed, um, just like the little boy who couldn't uh, stand to stay in bed all night, but she is instead not looking at the tree or the presence, but at, you know, the warm kind of glitter and glow of all of these adults socializing. And she is painted in this kind of cold white gray that really sets her apart from all of it. And I think this is such a universal image. We see her from behind and we can all project ourselves into her body and remember what it's like to feel so young and want to be a part of something that is way too old for you, <laughs> something you're not ready for yet. Um, just like that little guy that we saw before, but a different scenario. <laughs> um, a little bit more celebrating. Here we have a dad who is making music for his daughter and his dog to dance to. Um, the whole thing is encapsulated by this wonderful red ribbon. And we see other animals that are making music and similarly dancing here. So we've got a, a great sense of, of festivity with, with this particular image. Um, here is Norman Rockwell posing the dog. <laughs> you gotta love it. <laughs> um, another image of celebration, Norman Rockwell loved to paint these. I, I think he got assigned a lot of grandpa covers, but in this case, grandpa um, is there for Christmas and he is enjoying the, um, the presents maybe even more than his grandson. Maybe he's not even letting his grandson enjoy his presents because he's up on this rocking horse. This wonderful detail of how he's encapsulated in the circle. Um, it, this is um, uh, part of the composition so that it doesn't like interrupt the, the masthead of the Saturday Evening Post. At this point, um, uh, everybody knew what the Saturday Evening Post looked like, but you could sort of um, overlap it with this circle. And so Rockwell does such a good job of sort of wrapping these two figures into that circle there. Now, some of the celebrating I just find so funny. He did a couple of these advertisements for different pen companies. So over here on, on the on the left, we've got a young couple. They've just unwrapped presents from each other. They're standing underneath a mistletoe and um, and they're embracing after they realize that they both got the pens they wanted. <laughs> Look at his delight and surprise. I can tell you right now, she wanted a ring. <laughs> She's nowhere near this excited over, over pens, but um, the kiss that you would expect is really just them checking out their, their new pens. Over here, we have a dad who is just overjoyed that his little girl has given him some pens. It's all about the pens. And then um, here is a sweet scene that, uh, literally that Rockwell did for Milky Way with a little boy kind of lost in this Christmas reverie, unpacking his stocking here, eating his chocolate bar um, without really realizing that his dog is going in for a lick as well. Um, here's another Milky Way ad that he did with a little boy who's trying to get a kiss from a little girl. He's got the mistletoe over her head and he's got these little devilish horns with the red hair see that he's up to no good. If the mistletoe doesn't get her, the Milky Way will. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll end the, our celebration section with this beautiful older couple standing under the mistletoe, admiring each other, embracing each other, um, that feeling of like success, getting through another holiday season. And, um, and there's just such a sweetness here to their connection, their love. Rockwell revisits the same idea, slightly different pose a couple of decades later. Um, with with sort of the matriarch and the patriarch having this affectionate moment. So we'll wrap up with our scenes of exhaustion and we all know what it's like to be done with the holidays, right? <laughs> Maybe some of us are already done with the holidays. Rockwell shows us what Santa feels like at the end of his trip. It's December 25th. He's just torn the day off the calendar. He's just done his big um, trip around the world and he is like, <laughs> <laughs> just zonked. So he's kicked off his shoes, he's leaning back in his chair, and he's ready for a, a, a nice long rest. Um, there's something about these feet here sticking out that remind me a little bit of that shop girl that we saw before, but he's returned to the subject of an exhausted Santa several times. Here's a Santa in green socks, he's taken off his red boots, and he is just snoozing. It's, a, it's December 26th, and he's still asleep. Um, and then we have this notion of the exhaustion at the end of the vacation. Um, a little boy, this is an image from um, the 1920s, this is 1927. It's called Back to School After Christmas is Over. We've got like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree here. 
the toys are already broken. There's a tear running down his cheek. It's really hard for Christmas to end. But this picture always reminds me of that Christmas carol that goes, and mom and dad can hardly wait for school to start again. Send him back, right? Um, but as a kid, it's really hard for that vacation to be over. So speaking of being over, we're wrapping up now. And I'm just going to wrap up on just um, this you know, one hopeful note for the holiday season that takes us back to what was most important to Norman Rockwell. And that was the golden rule. He said, I've been reading up on comparative religion. The thing that all major religions have is the golden rule in common. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not always the same words, but always the same meaning. And I think that's that's the idea that will carry us through this time that is joyful, stressful, all of the above um, for so many people. So I thank you for joining me tonight and I welcome any questions or comments you might have. Thank you so much.